Um, <coughs> this is uh, environmental economics. If you're not here for environmental economics, now is a good time to leave. Um, my name is Richard Toll. I'll be here with you for the next um, 11 weeks. Um, this is what I used to look like. Um, if you need me for anything, I don't have office hours. I uh, work from home uh, Wednesday through Friday, uh, which unfortunately means that I'm available 24-7. Uh, so if you need me for anything, just send me an email. Some of you have already found my email address, but it's uh, there. Um, most things can be solved by email. Uh, if you want to talk face-to-face, -face, I think one-on-one -on -one is always easiest via Skype, but I'm also happy to organize um, um, a Zoom meeting if you prefer uh, that. Um, I am a uh, professor of economics here at the University of Sussex. My key research interests lie in climate, energy, uh, and the environment. And we'll be talking this term uh, about environmental problems. If your interest is mostly in the economics of climate change, then you will have to be patient uh, because that will be taught in uh, uh, next term, right? Next year for you guys, the first uh, term. Um, so, uh, so much uh, about that. What we're going to do in this particular uh, module um, is I'm going to give you a comprehensive introduction into the economic theory of environmental pollution and environmental policy. Uh, that is the aim. Uh, this is the first time ever uh, that I teach this course in second year. I'm used to teaching at Sussex in the third year. I uh, teach in other places uh, for two more senior uh, students. Um, so this will be a bit of an adjustment uh, for me, hopefully not too much for you. I'm going to assume that you're economists and you've done your micro and your macro and your calculus and a little bit of your stats as well. Um, there's two pieces of literature. Uh, the most important one is this book, Intermediate Environmental Economics by Charlie Kolstad. I put a link uh, in one of the announcements uh, on Canvas. Uh, the library is the library. They don't have enough copies for all of you. Um, so really, your best bet is to get uh, the book. Uh, one of the, there's two reasons I picked this book. One, it's actually relatively cheap compared to its competitors. Uh, it's also, I think, one of the better books uh, that is out there. The most popular book uh, to teach environmental economics is by uh, Lewis and Tietenberg, which is very much aimed at American liberal arts colleges. So essentially, it assumes that a vast number of the students in the room are not students of economics, and environmental economics is the only contact they will ever have with economics. Uh, so that level is too low. Um, the uh, popular alternative in uh, Europe uh, is a permanent all, which is much bigger uh, than this one, uh, and a bit chaotic. Um, and a lot more expensive uh, than this one. I like this book simply uh, better. Uh, so that is why uh, I picked this one. It is written by an American, right? So most of the examples, even though this is the international edition, most of the examples are from the US. Um, the book is also incomplete. Um, so what I am working on is my own lecture notes. And uh, those are for free on Canvas. But as you may have noticed, if you looked at it, it's far from com complete. Right? I think I finished about half uh, of the writing. Uh, what I will be doing as I prepare my lectures is also work on this. So keep an eye on the date that you see on Canvas. The version that is currently on there is from three days ago. And during the next uh, 14 weeks, I will be posting updates of this. Sometimes minor updates, sometimes uh, major updates. So do keep an eye uh, on this. Hopefully in two years or so, 
we can ditch Kolstad and switch just to lecture notes. Uh, but unfortunately for you guys, that is not, um, does not hold for you. Um, this is where I was. So, um, so much for the literature. There, there won't be a whole lot of. There won't be a whole lot of um, of papers uh, to read. Um, the lectures, as you know, are today from one till three, uh, and then the seminars. You guys are split in four groups, and they're all scheduled for Tuesday. And the seminar will follow on the Monday lecture. So it won't have a week in between. So tomorrow's seminar will be questions about today, right? Um, which is a bit short, uh, but um, that's the way it is. Uh, the things we're going to cover are uh, listed here uh, today. Um, I'm going to give you an introduction. I'm going to actually spend the first 40, 50 minutes or so on that introduction. Um, and then after uh, the break, uh, we're going to talk about social choice and about ethics uh, and utilitarianism and all that. Um, <clears throat> then uh, next week, we're going to do the core micro. And I know you have seen this material, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. Uh, what are externalities and what are public goods? Uh, then we're going to talk about cost-benefit analysis, more decision analysis, more general. And then we have three weeks where we're going to talk about monetary valuation. How do you put a price on something that does not have a market? Uh, and then three weeks on how to regulate the environment. Not, we're first going to talk about what you actually want to achieve. But then uh, we're also going to talk about how you would actually achieve this. Uh, so taxes, subsidies, direct regulation, tradable permits, all that. Um, and then the final two weeks are uh, for two special uh, topics. Uh, actually, it's wrong here. I'm going to talk about growth in the environment. I'm also going to talk about environmental justice. Um, and then in the very final week, we're going to talk about uh, green accounting. The... Uh, People who are in charge of the university think it is a good day to schedule uh, seminars like this. Uh, there's two problems uh, with uh, the way uh, we do this. One, we have to have an Easter break, and that Easter break has to be three weeks because East Sussex, West Sussex, and Brighton do not schedule their school holidays at the same time. So we need to have time off when our kids have time off. Uh, that's why it uh, spans to three weeks. Uh, and unfortunately, the way they do it is that there's one week of lectures and seminars after spring break, which I think is a bit ridiculous. Uh, and I know that some of my students uh, agree with me. Uh, so that is one problem. The other problem that we have is that we start this week. Now, you guys have had a week off since your exams. But we did not, right? We spent the last week correcting your exams rather than preparing for our lecture. So we would really much rather start a week or two later and then have a, a more substantial period after the break. But that is what it is. Uh, we will have to do uh, with uh, the things that we have been uh, given. Um, lectures will be very much one way. Uh, but if you want to interrupt me, that is perfectly fine. Uh, I know the material. I'm much more interested in what you have to say than what I have to say, because I know that already. Um, so if you want to turn this occasionally into a discussion, that is perfectly fine. Don't uh, be shy. Um, the way I plan to run things is, is I typically have two topics to cover. And I'm going to break somewhere in the middle. I'm not going to break exactly on the hour. Uh, but we're typically going to take a 10-minute break somewhere uh, in between can be after 40 minutes, can be after 60 minutes, uh, somewhere in between. Uh, but the main points where we're going to uh, discuss things are in the seminars. We're in a much smaller group. Uh, I'll be running all those seminars. Um, and we're going to do various things. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have what is framed as a problem set, but it's really points for discussion. Right, because of, that's the nature of the material. Uh, then I think it's next week that we're actually going to run a game. Uh, and then we're going to turn to more mathematical, more traditional problem sets, and so on and so forth, depending on the topic that we're uh, going on about. Um, 
There will also be occasional readings, but as I said, not too many. And I'll also make sure that definitely towards the end of term, we'll have time to also discuss the exam, right? Um, the way things are um, graded is as follows. Uh, there will be a take-home exam that counts for 70% in, uh, I actually don't know <laughs> when that is. I think it's uh, April uh, or maybe May. Um, in week uh, nine, if I'm not mistaken, don't believe me, believe what it says on Canvas uh, or on, uh, or on uh, Sussex Direct, right? Uh, there is an essay uh, due. Um, now, we have a problem with both the take-home exam and with the essay, and the problem is called uh, Chat GPT-3 that some of you uh, must have heard about uh, or some variant of that, this very clever, uh, very clever, serve, uh, very clever um, artificial intelligence that can write essays or half essays for you, right? Um, and it's the way it is, right? Just as we had to adjust for the emergence of Google, we now also have to adjust uh, for the emergence of these things. Take home exams are of course open book exams, open internet, ask your friends type of exams. We can't prevent you from doing so, so we should accommodate that. And now we have artificial intelligence to cope with as well. Um, and for that reason, um, I rearranged the order of the lectures uh, because I changed the nature of the essay. The essay has now become much more of a project than an essay. Uh, and that, of course, then also means that the weight of the exam uh, has uh, shifted. Um, so I went back to what I think is a more natural order that we're going to talk about valuation before we're going to talk about policy instruments because the essay will be an exercise in valuation rather than about policy instruments which I think uh, artificial intelligence can do for you, right? Uh, so there's no real test uh, there. So that is the plan. Um, there's also quizzes on campus. And although they are marked, they are strictly for revision. They don't count towards anything apart from your self-esteem and your self-confidence, right? Okay, that's the plan. Any questions about this? Or about anything else? Go ahead. I'm not wearing my glasses, so you need to be a bit more enthusiastic about sticking your hand up. <laughs> I only saw you. Just saw you. Okay, so we came out of the pandemic, right? Um, where we had to pre-record videos, which is what I did two years ago, I think, maybe a little bit longer. Um, so why not offer that to you? What I'm gonna say is very similar. Obviously, I presented slightly different and there's updates and different emphases, uh, but those videos are there for your convenience but you're under no obligation to watch them. I will, I'm also recording this video and I will, uh, this lecture and I will record all lectures and I will post that. So it's really up to you how you can best learn, right? Some people want to read a book. I will closely follow the two books, right? Uh, some people prefer to watch me live. That's perfectly fine. Some people prefer to watch me back on video. Some people prefer to watch uh, the pre-records of two years ago. It's totally up to you. Uh, because every person learns differently. What works for you is what you should do. Okay? No? Um, let's dive into... Um, why does this start at the end, right? Um, so I thought that before I go into the material itself, I'm going to talk about um, where does environmental economics actually come from? Because that helps in your understanding. Um, many of the things that we're going to deal with uh, later. Uh, so that's what I thought uh, we're going to start with. 
Um, the points that you see here are very much the things that you should take away. If in two years time, these are the bullet points that you recall, that this is what I really taught you, uh, then I'll be happy, right? Obviously, this is, these are not the exam questions, right? But if you take away uh, these messages, um, then um, we'll be uh, fine. Uh, so the first thing is one thing that we're going to argue again and again and again is that a free market, an unregulated market, will not deliver the desired quality of the environment. Um, and uh, environmental economics is all about uh, two things. One, what is the desired environmental quality? And second, given that we have agreed or in some other way set on uh, a target environmental quality, how do we actually achieve that? And what I will argue again and again and again is that it's all about trade-offs. What I will argue after the break is that we should be very careful about how we, or not just after the break, but actually throughout, uh, is how we actually quantify and visualize those trade-offs. What is included, how are things included, who is included, who is excluded, right? That is uh, very important. And it's also very important to realize that I'm not going to give you answers, but I'm going to give you a tool to think through what the answer could be. But there will be a lot of normative elements in there, and it's not for me to dictate your preferences, right? That is for you. Um, returning to uh, desirable environmental quality, I will also argue, uh, mostly in week three, that zero pollution may seem ideal, uh, but actually I'm going to argue that it's not desirable uh, at all uh, because of those trade-offs. Typically, uh, pollution also brings uh, positives. Um, but I'm also going to argue, and now we're uh, already in the second half, uh, of the module is that the old way of doing environmental policy, so-called command and control or direct regulation, which is essentially the government telling you what to do and how to do it and what not to do, that it actually very rarely works for environmental problems that we have today. It worked in the 70s, it worked in the 80s, it doesn't work uh, anymore in the 2020s. Um, and instead, I'm going to argue that we use, should use taxes and subsidies and tradable permits, because that is much better suited for the type of environmental problems that we have today. Uh, I'm also going to argue, I should have changed the order, <laughs> is that there are things that we care about that are not traded on markets. I don't think I have to uh, convince you of that. Uh, but I We'll also try and convince you that we can actually put a price on those things, that we can pretend as if they are traded on markets and is as if they have a price, right? Um, and that, that means that we can extend the national accounts to environmental concerns. And that is the very last lecture uh, that we're going to talk about. Um, and the week before that, uh, in lecture time, four weeks in real time, uh, I'm going to also argue that the burden of pollution and therefore also the benefits of environmental policy often falls on marginalized groups. And of course it differs uh, across societies who are the marginalized, uh, whether it's the lower case in India or whether it's the black population uh, in the United States. Um, but it's often the marginalized that uh, take the heaviest burden of environmental problems, right? So these are the take-home messages. If you recall this in two years' time, uh, I'd be very, very happy. Uh, and what we're going to do over the next 10, 10, 11 weeks is put uh, some meat on this bone. And we're going to talk about all sorts of environmental problems. Um, and here we see pictures uh, of some of them. Uh, the top right, you're looking at uh, Los Angeles, and this is smog. This is conventional air pollution. It's not just that you can't see the city because of the haze, which you could see as 
visual intrusion, uh, but this is also pretty bad for your health. It's also pretty bad for uh, uh, monuments and everything uh, in the city. So that, that is one of the problems uh, that you can think of. Uh, the other problem, uh, another problem that you can think of, uh, top left, uh, represents uh, acid rain or acidification, where if you burn coal, if you burn oil, you release sulfur into the atmosphere, it goes through a series of uh, uh, chemical transformations and then comes down as an acid. And it was long believed that that kills uh, trees and is one of the reasons for the dieback of the forests, uh, not just in uh, the United Kingdom and not just in Europe, but across the world. Fortunately, acid rain is mostly on the way out uh, in so the rich parts of the world. That's a very big problem uh, in South and East Asia and a big problem in Latin America and a growing problem uh, in Africa. At uh, the bottom right, you're looking at uh, the hole in the ozone layer, um, which if you follow the news of the last couple of weeks, we now believe we have solved. And in 20, maybe 30 years time, this problem will be mostly gone. Um, and that is another environmental problem uh, that we're going to talk about. The, pr the problem with the hole in the ozone layer is that it lets in, or that the ozone layer keeps out UVB radiation. And we don't like UVB radiation because it gives us cancer, right? Uh, and the hole in the ozone layer contributed to uh, particularly skin cancer uh, across uh, the world. Um, the problem I'm not going to talk about is the left bottom, and that is climate change. As I said, we're going to do that next term uh, after summer. Uh, but it's, of course, an environmental problem that is on people's uh, mind all the time. Now, you may have heard uh, of these problems in various guises, depending on where you're from. Everybody's heard of climate change. Uh, depending where you're from, you can also, may also have heard of the others. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of other problems, environmental problems, that generally people are not very aware of. Uh, the, Bottom right is one of my favorites. This is a river catching fire. Uh, this was in the 70s, right? Those sort of problems are fortunately gone in the United States and in Europe. Uh, but you still see things like this happening in China occasionally and in Africa, right? Rivers are supposed not to catch fire because they're made of water, right? And if they do catch fire, there is something seriously wrong with it. Um, uh, top left is another problem that many people do not realize, so-called eutrophication. Uh, so by the over-application of fertilizers on farms, so fertilizer is good because it makes your crops grow better. Fertilizer is also pretty cheap, so if you're uncertain about how much fertilizer to apply, you're going to throw on more than you really need. Plants don't care, they take up the, the, the nutrients that they need and the rest then washes uh, off into groundwater and into surface water. Um, and they are fertilizer, they make plants grow and particularly they tip the balance of plant life to the lowest forms, to algae, who uh, thrive on this, outcompete all other plants and use all the oxygen in the water so that fish die and so on and so forth and essentially uh, it, it turns um, fresh water into green soup uh, and actually it can turn uh, parts of seawater uh, into essentially dead zones because they take out all the oxygen and then the algae themselves also die. Uh, so that is a problem um, that we can talk about. It used to be that it was not just agriculture that produced a lot of eutrophying uh, substances but it was also uh, detergents, the stuff that we use to wash ourselves and our dishes and our clothes also used to have a lot of eutrophying substances in them. Uh, we taken those out uh, and replaced them because of concerns about eutrophication and replaced them uh, with other things and some of these things that we replaced them with are so-called endocrine disruptors, which is a term that doesn't mean anything uh, to most of you. They are pseudo-hormones, right? Uh, and the key word there is hormones. So what you look at the top left are uh, pictures of frogs 
And there's two things wrong with these frogs. Uh, and I need to explain what sort of the big appendage uh, is that you see here. Uh, that's not legs, that's penises. And what you can see is that they're fairly large relative to the body, right? The thing that you do not know is that these are female frogs, right? Now, frogs don't differ that much in their metabolism uh, from us. So if a little bit of pseudo-hormones can do this to tiny, element, uh, tiny animals that live in water, it can also do similar things at a smaller scale to us much bigger humans who do not live in the water, but of course consume a lot of water, right? Um, so we uh, may be thinking of environmental problems like that. Uh, this is not a photo, but a cartoon. Um, do similar things with antibiotics. Um, so <coughs> if you go to the doctor and you get a course in antibiotics, then and actually if you look at the label, then it says 10 milliliters if you're over 12. And that's the doses that you get. And if you look around, some of us are fairly big, some of us are fairly small, but we all get, we're all over 12, I presume, uh, you all get uh, the 10 milliliters. And it is uh, the right prescription for the biggest uh, among us, which means that the smaller in the room would get an overdose. Now, that is not a big problem because your kidneys will deal with that and you just pee it all out, right? Um, which, of course, means that the excess antibiotics end up in the sewage system and from there into the waters, right? And it's not just that antibiotics are prescribed to humans, they're also prescribed at a very large scale to farm animals, right? And also oversubscribed, and it also ends up uh, in the water. And these are molecules that are designed to change biology, right? They are designed to make your body work differently. And we're putting lots of this stuff uh, into uh, the waters, and God knows what will happen, right? Um, and then there's other environmental problems. Um, we can talk about badger calls, right? That's a bit out of the news uh, at the moment. Uh, badgers are good for nature. Uh, they're bad for cows because they spread TB. Uh, bovine tuberculosis, not human tuberculosis. Uh, we can talk about uh, the um, plastics that we dump into the ocean. And then there's lots of plastic that end up uh, in the seas and in the oceans. And then because of the way ocean currents work and because plastics are sort of designed to last, they sort of accumulate. And what you see there is a picture at the top uh, left is a picture uh, in the great uh, garbage spats that is in um, this bit here, that's the big green bit uh, in uh, the Pacific Ocean. But you also have things like that floating around in the Atlantic uh, Ocean and in the North Sea. Um, and then last but certainly not least, uh, we emit a lot of particulate matter, very fine particles. These are particles that are um, 10 nanometers, no, 10 micrometers. Uh, or uh, less, uh, so fairly f f fine particles um, that do all sorts of damage to all sorts of everything. Um, and you also have the very fine particles at PM2.5, which are finer still, and they are so fine that they can just penetrate uh, your brains, right? So there's the bigger particles, there's the problems associated have to do with asthma and those sort of things, uh, respiratory problems mostly. The very fine particles are so fine that they penetrate the membrane that is around your brain and actually can interfere with the way your brain works. And what we've seen in fairly robust empirical evidence that this affects the decisions that chess players make, who cares, uh, it affects uh, the decisions that stockbrokers make. And you actually can see some of the volatility on the stock market, or volatility on the stock market is particularly high uh, during very polluted uh, days. Uh, it can affect the decisions that referees make during matches. Uh, 
Uh, some of you may care about that. Nah. <laughs> the decision that went against you is because of air pollution. It also affects uh, students' performance during exams. Uh, has also been documented. So this is all fairly uh, serious, right? So that is the sort of problems um, that uh, you should think about when we think about environmental problems and some of the uh, economic um, implications of all that, right? So what have economists actually thought and said about uh, the environment? And I have 20 minutes uh, to take you through the history, which is a long history, right? It goes back 3,000 years. Uh, if you look at the very beginning of economics, uh, when we did not used to call it economics, um, so let's call it proto-economics, the, the, the very first writings of people about economic matters were all about agriculture, because the economy in the ancient Greek times, in the ancient Roman times, were agricultural economies, right? Uh, economies, right? So people naturally thought uh, about these things. It was essentially about uh, how to run a farm uh, and those sort of things. Uh, that is what the early economics was about. So very closely tied uh, to uh, the environment. And people were really, really keenly aware of the importance of the environment. Um, and one of the older schools that I come back to uh, in big four of economics proper, the physiocrats, uh, really placed nature and land as the heart of their value system, right? I'll get back uh, to that. Uh, but it wasn't just that these uh, early economists were keenly aware of the importance of the environment. They actually thought that the environment dominated uh, everything, right? Uh, they thought that the human condition was primarily shaped by climate uh, and geography. Uh, and this is Aristotle. Those who live in a cold climate and in Europe are full of spirit but wanting in intelligence and skill uh, and are incapable of ruling over others. Uh, whereas the natives of Asia are intelligent and inventive uh, but are wanting in spirit and therefore always in a state of subjection and uh, slavery. So essentially he said Europeans um, have brawn but no brain. Um, whereas Asians have brain but no brawn, right? But us Greek, who are somewhere in between Europe and Asia, have both, right? Um, of course, Aristotle was quite wrong about the ability of uh, Europeans to rule over others, right? This is the largest extent of the British uh, Empire, as you are no doubt uh, aware of, right? Uh, but they truly thought that, and this particular thought that the environment sort of predominates everything and can explain all of human history um, is, was actually quite common. It wasn't just Aristotle, it wasn't just the Greeks, so the Romans, the Arabs, the ancient Chinese all thought uh, the same uh, thing. Now we think this is a bit silly, right? Or most of us, when you read statements like uh, Aristotle's, you think uh, this is a bit silly. Uh, but environmental determinism uh, is still around, right? In intellectual circles, uh, this guy here, uh, Jared Diamond, uh, is probably the main ex living exponent of environmental determinism. But also, if you sort of like listen closely to what the people of Extinction Rebellion, for instance, say, yeah, they think that climate is important, that climate change is important enough to kill us all, right? Which is a form of environmental uh, determinism, right? Uh, so this school of thought is unfortunately uh, still with us. There's absolutely no empirical evidence uh, to back this up. <clears throat> uh, economists actually pretty quickly realize the importance not just of the environment, but also of pollution. And here uh, we have Marquis de Condorcet at the top, um, who wrote about agricultural activity, uh, that it corrupts the air, causes illness uh, in uh, neighboring homes. Now the picture that you see here is obviously not from Condorcet's time. Um, this is a few years ago in India, right? Where the burning of crop residue causes tremendous uh, environmental problems in the cities, right? Also in the countryside, but there's fewer people to suffer from it. 
uh, but you have wild burning of pretty wet um, biomass that causes all sorts of <clears throat> all sorts of chemicals to be released into the air, right? Many of them carcinogenic, right? Um, <coughs> and it was actually not Condorcet who first realized this. King Edward uh, I uh, actually thought that coal burning in London was so obnoxious uh, that he tried to ban it, right, unsuccessfully. If you read through the history of evolution of London, then you see, starting in 1273, uh, every generation or so, they try to do something about air pollution in London, mostly to do with coal burning. Coal burning, of course, only went out of London homes and around 1960, right? So it took them 700 years, almost, to sort out this particular problem, right? Um, so now look, uh, let's look at uh, classical um, economics. Um, <clears throat> so all classical economists, without exception, were convinced that in the very long run, constraints on resource availability, agriculture, energy, um, meant that the economy, economic growth would come to a standstill. Without a, an exception, they all uh, thought that. Um, <clears throat> and of course, if the total economy cannot expand, if the population continues to grow, that can only mean that people will become poorer, right? This was the prevailing, the unanimous position of classical economists. Um, we have a similar argument today in the degrowth movement. People who argue that we should give up on, an, on economic growth to save the environment, but for a different reason. So the classical economists thought that it was necessity that would halt economic expansion. The current degrowth movement say it's a moral obligation that we should halt economic expansion to save the environment. Um, other than that, uh, classical economists are, of course, basically all followed uh, Adam Smith, the Nightwatch state, right? They argued that individual action would lead to the social optimum, and therefore there was no need for government intervention. Um, and that was basically what uh, they all argued, right? Um, Adam Smith himself actually made an exception, and we'll come back to that next week, uh, for public goods. He did realize that there was no individual incentive, no reason for any individual company or uh, household or person to provide public goods. And that was the only reason for some sort of societal provision. Uh, Adam Smith also argued, by the way, that public goods, such as education, uh, should not be provided by the state, but should be provided through charity, right? Rather than levy taxes and use their revenue to provide the public goods, Adam Smith said, no, we should just go around with a begging bowl and do it like that. But he did realize that there was no inherent incentive, no inherent reason for anybody to provide public goods. Other than that, he did not uh, care much. <clears throat> um, the notion that economic growth must come to an end is typically associated with Thomas Malthus. Uh, and as I said, he was definitely not the only uh, economist uh, at that time uh, to argue this. Uh, and Malthus's uh, theory is fairly simple. Uh, population grows geometrically that is exponentially. So what we, most people call exponential growth, mathematicians call geometric uh, growth, uh, but it's the same thing. So if population grows exponentially, uh, food production, uh, Malthus argued, could only grow arithmetically. That is, it's a linear process rather than an exponential process. Now, in the very long run, 
an exponential process will always grow faster than uh, a linear process, right? So in the end, the more than linear curve will also be always be bigger than the linear uh, curve. And that, of course, means that we're going to hit uh, the Malthusian cat catastrophe at one point. We're going to run out of food to feed the people. Now, uh, th th you still see a lot of that in, uh, among environmentalists, right? This notion that there's these absolute constraints and we're heading to a catastrophe. Um, and we should do something about it. Maltes also wanted to do something about it. Uh, he essentially argued that we should have fewer children, and the best way to have fewer children is abstinence, right? This is the 18th century. And, of course, he was a reverend, uh, so he had a, 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 another agenda there, right? He wanted to, arg to argue for abstinence. Um, <clears throat> so that is what he thought. Um, other uh, classical economists basically agreed with Malthus. Uh, David Ricardo said, yeah, you should not just focus on the intensive margin, uh, but it's also extensive margin. You should not just focus on improving current croplands, but we can also bring new croplands into cultivation. But then he immediately undermined that argument by saying, well, actually, the lands that are best suited for agriculture are under cultivation already. Right? So it does not really uh, help us. Um, Jevons, uh, who we'll meet uh, a couple of times uh, again, did not focus on food, but focused on energy. And Jevons noted that coal consumption in rapidly industrializing England and Scotland was growing so fast that we would very quickly run out of coal, right? And that this would bring an end uh, to economic growth. Uh, what you see here in this picture is the actual, so he argued this in 1865, oh my god, we're going to run out of coal. <laughs> uh, and this is the actual coal production uh, that we have witnessed, uh, seen. He could not quite imagine that there were coal fields uh, elsewhere uh, outside the north of England. Um, but he definitely thought that. Um, <clears throat> John Stuart Mill. I agreed with Maldes and Ricardo, but we also have input substitution, we have innovation, um, and also uh, argued um, that perhaps we should not just focus on economic growth, but also on the value of that. And he wrote in 1857, uh, it's only in backward countries of the world that increase production growing GDP is still an important objective, right? Uh, of course, you would still hear politicians say the exact same thing. Now, I showed you pictures of the people who were writing, and here we have two pictures. Uh, at, top, at the top, you're looking at uh, Stuart Mill. At the bottom, you're looking at Harriet uh, Taylor Mill. Um, the books by John Stuart, the books have all a single author. John Stuart Mill, right? Uh, later in his life, towards the end of his life, he wrote and said that actually his wife, Harriet, co-wrote most of his works. Now, there's a, a, a number of people who say, well, this is just an older man who still besotted with his much younger wife, and he just wanted to give her credit. Uh, contemporary records actually show that, yes, he was a pretty clever one. So chances are, yes, this was indeed all co-written. And whenever you hear John Stuart Mill, realize that there was somebody working in the background. Uh, the Mills also wrote uh, this. There is room in the world, no doubt, for a uh, great increase in population, supposing the arts of life go on to go on improving. That is uh, uh, innovation and capital to increase. Uh, the density of population necessary to obtain all the advantages both of cooperation and social intercourse has been attained. They're writing in all the form of English, right? Intercourse meant something different uh, in those days. A population may be too crowded, uh, they'll all be uh, amply supplied with food and raiment. 
uh, nor is there much satisfaction in contemplating the world with nothing left to the spontaneous activity of nature. So the mills argued that, yeah, at a certain point economic growth will come to a stop because we've run out of things to grow on, but we should actually want to stop growing our economies before that time. We want to leave something for nature, and something for us to enjoy. <clears throat> and he was, or they were the first uh, to say this, right? Um, so a detour, um, the classical economists were all children of the Enlightenment, right? And uh, not everybody was in favor of the Enlightenment. And uh, there were a counter movement, and the early counter movement uh, was so called sentimentalism. And you know about the Enlightenment and what it did for chemistry and physics and those sort of things. But as a big part of the Enlightenment, Adam Smith and all those people, was also that it should be a very rational approach, a very technocratic approach to decision making. The felicity calculus. Uh, of uh, classical uh, economists, that actually you could do the sums and then figure out what is best government policy, right? Uh, so the sentimentalists argued, no, sometimes we just want to do things because it makes us feel good, right? Or just <laughs> because, right? And there should be a, r a room for emotion in decision making. Um, romanticism uh, picked that up. Uh, romanticism is the main counter movement uh, to the Enlightenment. Um, and they argued that nature was, is not something that is dangerous and to be tamed and subjected to human will, but nature is actually something that can be enjoyed. And the Romanticists were the first to argue this. Not surprisingly, this was at the time in Europe that nature was truly tamed, that you could walk into the forest and there was very little chance that you would meet a bear or a wolf or something else that would eat you, right? Uh, so nature had become safe, and actually at that time you could no longer walk in Europe, or at least in Western Europe, without sort of being more than 20 kilometers from another human being, right? So it was pretty safe. And of course by that time also most of uh, the robbers and highwaymen uh, were gone, right? So Europe had become safe enough to just go wander in the forest to enjoy yourself. And before that, that was not the case. Um, the uh, Romanticists also were very much against industrialization. And they were harking for a simpler past. Life was going too fast, cities were becoming too crowded and too noisy, uh, factories were becoming smelly, right? This whole notion that life used to be better goes back to Romanticism. Now, why do I say this? Because Romanticism uh, brought about, Romanticism is long dead, right? But it brought about three movements that are still alive. Uh, <coughs> the first is Communism, is one of the children of Romanticism. And the argument of the Romanticists was that this harking back to a past, when everybody lived in villages and most things were sort of in communal property, right? So this is not the Marxism of Marx and Engels, this is not the communism of Lenin and Stalin, right? It's very much industrial. Um, but this is the communism of Tito and Mao and Pol Pot, right? And Pol Pot is perhaps the most extreme uh, example of this. He essentially killed everybody in the city, or and those who were not killed in the city were sent to the countryside, right? That comes uh, from the Romanticists, right? When we all lived in villages, life was much better. <coughs> um, another part of harking for a simpler past is there used to be strong and just kings to rule us, right? Arthur, the once and future king, was there. And things were better then, right? And that is, of course, the longing for a strong leader that you see in fascism. And 
also in that mythical past, everybody was blonde with blue eyes, right? And the racial supremacy in the Blut and Boden of the Nazis also finds its roots in this part of Romanticism, right? And then the other thing that Romanticism spawned is first the naturalist movement, that we go out in nature to enjoy ourselves and we can learn from that and we will be better people if we do so, that later morphed into environmentalism, right? That is another child of Romanticism. And because it is another child of Romanticism, it is also opposed to enlightenment, right? Because that is where Romanticism started as a movement that opposed the enlightenment. Uh, and that is one of the tensions that we will see throughout, and one of the tensions <coughs> that is always uh, with us when we talk about environmental economics. And environmental economics is a child of the enlightenment, whereas environmentalism is a child of Romanticism, right? And the two are at odds at a very deep level uh, with one another. Now, <laughs> returning to the history of uh, environmental economics. Um, we had the neoclassical revolution in 1870, uh, Jevons, uh, Menger, uh, Walra. Um, value is relative, partial general equilibrium, uh, all those tools uh, that by now you know, right? Um, I'll talk about the value theory uh, in a few weeks. Um, all those things were developed in the 1870s, primarily uh, by the three gentlemen uh, that you see here. And one of the notions of the marginal revolution is that everything happens at the margin and there's no room anymore for totals. There's no absolute scarcity, there's only relative scarcity. Now this was a reflection of the time, right? And this was the time of the final push into the west of uh, North America, uh, the final push uh, into India and Siberia and Africa. From the perspective of people sitting in Austria or France or uh, England, the world was unbounded, right? Because yeah, there were some black people, uh, but you just pushed them away, right? The opportunity seemed uh, limitless. Uh, also rapid uh, industrialization, industrialization, rapid innovation uh, at uh, the time. So from their perspective, the world was limitless and you only needed to look at the margin, right? And yeah, they had very little to say about the environment. Uh, that did not change much uh, with Keynesian economics, right? Uh, although it did have some effect, what, did, what Keynes did resurrect was an interest by professional economists in what happens in the long run. Although Keynes, of course, said that in the long run we're all dead, uh, but he did invoke a new interest in dynamic processes rather than just looking at uh, the margin. But if you look at the early uh, growth models that you've been taught about in macro by Harrod and Domer or Solo or Koopmans, um, output, Y, is a function of capital and labor right? Mm -hmm. Or in Herodomer, just capital. Um, there's no environment there. We can grow as long as total factor productivity keeps up, as long as uh, uh, capital keeps deepening, as long as the labor force keeps growing, the economy will keep growing. There is no resource limit there. There's no energy, there's no food, there's no land, there's no climate, there is no nothing. <clears throat> It's not to say that in this period the environment was completely forgotten. I talked about Jevons uh, and his resource limits. Uh, this was picked up later by Harold Hotelling, um, who was looking at exhaustible resources uh, like uh, oil. Uh, but all of this stuff, even though it was written in the 1930s and the 1860s, uh, was essentially out of the mainstream. This is not something that you would find in uh, the textbooks. <coughs> Uh, it's not to say that environment was completely not there. Uh, Marshall, in his series of textbooks, did write about externalities. That is, if there's unintended and uncompensated consequences of one agent's actions on another, a third party, then it is no longer the case that the invisible, invisible hand will generate the social good, right? 
Uh, Marshall did realize that. He did not know how to solve that. Um, now, uh, pause again. Uh, you see Marshall at the very top there. <coughs> what you see next to him is a picture of his wife, Mary Paley. Now, Marshall was no males, right? Towards the end of his life, Marshall hated his wife, right? And he denied that she had ever done anything good in her life, right? Earlier records suggest that, yes, Mary Paley co-wrote a whole bunch of Alfred Marshall's work, but he would never acknowledge that, right? Uh, but probably she did. Um, now, <coughs> Marshall wrote about externalities and realized uh, the social good thing through individual action doesn't work anymore. Did not know how to solve it. It was actually his student, Alfred P. Gu, um, who introduced the solution that you can come up with a six, uh, system of taxa uh, taxes and subsidies to counteract uh, the negative effects of externalities. Um, I hasten to add that our current understanding is actually due to the guy you see here, Francis uh, Bator. Um, Pigou introduced the Pigou tax, the tax that introduced externality, that corrects for externalities. But Pigou did not know what an externality was. Bator knew both how environmental taxes work, but also knew what is an externality, right? Um, Marshall also worked uh, on overexploitation of common uh, property. So most of the themes that we're going to talk about, public goods, externalities, were there already in the 1870s and definitely in the 1920s, right? So much of this stuff is fairly old. Uh, three more minutes and then we're going to break. Um, so where does environmental economics come from? So what I've said is the environment was important in the early days and then it basically disappeared from the mainstream of economics until, until, until the 1960s and the 1970s. Because things changed, and three things changed in particular. One was the publication of the first report of the Club of Rome called Limits to Growth. And this was your standard Malthusian story, the world is going to collapse. And actually the first report uh, predicted catastrophe for 1982. Now most of you were not born then, right? This is a long time ago. But had the world ended in 1982, you would not have been here, right? So you can, be, you can rest assured that the catastrophe foretold did not happen. Uh, the other thing that ha happened uh, is the publication in 1963 of the book Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Uh, and what uh, Carson uh, wrote was um, that because of the use of PCBs, which were uh, a pesticide, uh, one that bioaccumulates, so it kills all the bugs, which is good because otherwise they would eat our crops, uh, but uh, birds eat those insects and they're full of chemicals, full of pesticides, and because of that the shells of their eggs weaken and essentially their offspring is not viable. All the young birds die. And that leads to a spring without birds, right? And that is where the title comes from. And everybody believed her, and it caused a, a big stir. Uh, we had the oil crisis of 73 and 78. We had a lot of pollution. I showed you the picture of the river on fire. Um, we had the first traffic jams in these years, uh, and something that is very difficult for you guys to imagine, we had space travel. <clears throat> and we all know that the world is round, right? But really, if you just look around, the world is flat, right? And it's pretty big. And also, the way people le learned geography was to look at maps. And the Soviet Union and the United States had different colors on the map, so they were different countries, right? And when we first went to space and people sent back, sent back pictures of space, people realized the first 
I mean, everybody knew that the world was round, but this was the first time you could see that the world was round, right? And you could also see that uh, actually Germany looks just like England and there's no reason to hate them, right? Because from space we all, all our countries look the same. And that actually changed the mindset in a way that you guys can't imagine, right? Because you were born 30 years after the fact. But this was a major shock to the psyche uh, at the time. Talked about those things. And then environmental uh, economics really started, or actually two versions of environmental economics uh, started. Uh, one uh, goes back to this guy here, Ken Balding, um, who said famously, anybody uh, who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. And this is a return to the classical economics, right? And we will meet this again uh, towards the very end in the work of Ries and Wackernackel. Um, that is, there are Malthusian limits to the economy. Um, Around the same time, uh, Nicolaus Ceausescu uh, Rogan uh, acknowledged that these early growth models, actually the current growth models as well, have an economy that is disembodied. It's not part of the environment. The environment is not in uh, the economy, and the economy is not in the environment. Right? And he was the first uh, to work on that. <clears throat> um, we also had uh, the uh, Ehrlich uh, Simon uh, wager, right? Uh, Paul Ehrlich is the club of Rome. He predicted in 1970 that sometime in the next 15 years the end will come. You've heard that before, right? <laughs> the end will come and will come soon. And by the end, I mean an utter breakdown of the capacity of the planet to support humanity. Uh, Simon took uh, issue with that, and they actually had a bet about what hap will happen to the prices of resources over the next 10 years. And uh, Simon <laughs> won that bet. Um, um, and from that, the less, from the, the, the debacle of the predictions of Paul Ehrlich, really came the uh, realization that the real limit to economic growth is human ingenuity, right? Um, so, <coughs> where are we? And then we're going to break. Um, environmental economics, the one that harks back to Simon, the one that harks back to Pigou and Bator, is the dominant form of environmental economics, right? Where we see the environment as a problem at the margin, as externalities to be corrected, as public goods to be provided, rather than a problem that is fundamental to capitalism and we should overthrow society uh, and all those sort of things. Um, and I hasten to add, uh, environmental economics is still very much modern synthesis, right? A lot of the tools that we use in environmental economics were before Dixit Stiglitz. And a lot of the empirical tools that we see in environmental economics, and that is changing at the moment, is the whole credibility revolution. A lot of stuff uh, predates that. So for those of you who want to be at the forefront of economics, environmental economics is a little bit stuck in uh, the 19th. 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, unfortunately. It's changing, but changing uh, slowly. There is another form of environmental economics that is called ecological economics, and that is very much down with uh, capitalism type of economics, right? I'm not going to teach that. We're going to see some examples of that, but uh, I do not subscribe to that as all, and I don't, at all, and I don't think that should be part of the program. I am a bit behind schedule, um, so I'm going to talk about the ethical foundations of social choice, and then the discussion of sustainability will really have to come next week, but next week was not over full anyway, so uh, no read to worry. Now, <clears throat> some of the things uh, that I'm going to say may will strike you as strange. Why is this part of an economics uh, module? Um, and the reason is twofold. One, um, 
there's a lot of normative elements in environmental economics. We're not just going to talk about um, what happens if we impose a tax on sulfur emissions, uh, but we're also going to talk about what should the tax on sulfur emissions be and what is the right amount of sulfur emissions. And those are ethical questions, those are normative questions. Um, <clears throat> so this is just an essential part of any uh, public economics, right, the normative part. Um, and I realize that you guys have had very little exposure to public economics and even less exposure to the ethical foundations of utilitarianism. And utilitarianism is, of course, the ethical foundation on which most of economics is built. Um, so that is why uh, I do this. Uh, and, of course, you should realize that even though economics is built on utilitarianism, if you ask any ethicist what they think of utilitarianism, they look at you funny, right? Because it is really a minority position outside of economics. It's the majority position inside economics, but the majority position in the outside uh, world. Um, so you should be um, aware of that. Um, I'm going to talk about three things in particular. I'm going to talk about uh, naturalism first, and then I'm going to talk about two schools of humanism. Um, but let's first look at naturalism, or rather, you can't talk about ethics without talking about Immanuel Kant. Uh, here you see the man, um, uh, and uh, philosophers will hate me uh, for saying this, but I think uh, Kant did two things. Uh, two uh, fairly straightforward things. Uh, the first is that he introduced the notion of a moral agent. And this is simply the unit of analysis of, ethicic, uh, of ethicists, right? Just as we have economic agents in uh, economics, and uh, we have moral agents in uh, philosophy. Uh, and the second thing um, <coughs> that he introduced was, is uh, the rule of universality. That is, if a rule applies to one moral agent, it applies to all moral agents. So, to give an example, uh, if I argue that you are not allowed to chop off my arm, and I don't think you are allowed to do that, then if I am a moral agent and you are a moral agent, then if I want to impose this rule on you, then I also impose this rule on myself. And if I say you can't chop off my arm, then by implication I can't chop off your arm, right? And I really think that it, that is all there is to count. Don't tell any philosopher that I said this because they will uh, not be kind to me, right? I, I think this is very much like the Christian do not unto others, but again philosophers would say I'm crazy. Um, that's all there is to count. The question is, who is a moral agent? That is the big question in naturalism. Um, and uh, when this was argued, the people who did the arguing were all rich, white, male, Protestant uh, people, right? I should have said Protestant men. Um, and they argued that the only thing that matters is rich, white, Protestant men, right? People who are like us are the only ones that mattered. And if you look at the balance of political power, who actually had a say in society, it was rich, white, Protestant men, period, right? And initially, philosophy was about justifying the powers, right? Now, that changed. And the first thing that changed uh, goes back to Jeremy Bentham, um, who argued that government should work towards the greatest good for the greatest number. Now, we now see this as very right wing. Because essentially, you're just adding up welfare and you don't care about distributional issues. At the time, this was radical, radical uh, left. Because essentially what 
Bentham argued, or what people saw him argue, and I'll get back to what he actually argued, was that poor lives matter, that the government should not be run for the benefit of rich white Protestant men, but it should also run for the benefit of poor white Protestant men. Right? And this was a radical proposition at the time. Um, Bentham wrote this a century before poor people were allowed to vote in this country. And Bentham said, well, perhaps we should care about paupers as well. Now, this set in chain a, this set in motion a chain of reactions, right? Because if it was no longer the case that as a philosopher you could say, well, I am rich and white and Protestant and male, and therefore I'm going to argue that rich, white, Protestant men are the best and uh, to hell with the rest, if I can no longer make the argument that the only people that count are people who are like me, you need to draw the boundary somewhere else, right? It is no longer we argue things because it's like ourselves. Uh, so the poor were the first to be included. Um, then people argued it's not just poor lives matter, but perhaps women are uh, human too, right? Uh, people slowly began to dawn, began, slowly began to dawn on people that perhaps women count as well, right? And here you see Emmeline Parkhurst. And then later, people argued it's not just white people, but there's people with other colored skin that perhaps are not subhuman, but human. And perhaps we should act in their interest too, right? Um, but then you have, a, it was still rich white Protestant men that did this arguing, right, mostly. And the argument was no longer only people like us are included or only beings like us. Well, then you have to come up with an argument. Why are women included? What makes them like us? Well, how do we define us, essentially? And then a bunch of philosophers uh, came up with a trick. It is because we understand the difference between ourselves and others, and we can comprehend the implications of our actions on others, and that is what set us sets us apart, and that is what makes us moral agents. Right, so for a while, uh, that was the agreement among philosophers, uh, and then those pesky biologists uh, discovered that higher animals can do this too. If you put a, a parakeet in front of a mirror, then the parakeet will think there is another parakeet there. Let's sing a song together. And even if the parakeet in the mirror does not respond to the song that the parakeet, the real parakeet is singing, the parakeet does not realize that he's on his own or she is on his own. If you put an elephant in front of a mirror, the elephant will recognize itself, right? If you study animal behavior, you know that Elephants have strong sense of community, strong sense of moral duties. They know when they have done something wrong towards another elephant or towards uh, humans or other species for that matter. Elephants clearly have moral reasoning. The same is true uh, for uh, chimps and gorillas uh, and animals like that. Probably it extends to uh, crows and other uh, uh, animals as well. You have a cat or a dog, and dogs also know when they've done something wrong, right? Um, so if the argument is really what matters is our ability to understand that we harm others, and that we feel shame or a duty to try and prevent that, then these rules should extend to higher animals as well, right? And that is, of course, a 
accepted position uh, in England, right? Uh, we are against cruelty and definitely unnecessary cruelty to animals, right? Just as we are against cruelty to humans, we are against cruelty to animals. So this is an acceptable position, at least in English uh, society and in other parts uh, of the world as well. <coughs> but that is a, 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 a bit strange. If you're like uh, Bentham and you argue for the greatest good for the greatest number, then really what matters is good, right? Not so much your ability to recognize the consequences of your action and to feel shame uh, about that. Actually, what matters is uh, pain and pleasure. And uh, that parakeet may not be able to recognize that the thing in the mirror is not a real parakeet, but it's definitely able to recognize pain and pleasure. And perhaps we should extend the calculus. We should include, at least to some degree, animals in our reasoning as well. Now at this point I need to return to Bentham. As I said, Bentham at the time was very much interpreted as poor lives matter, right? That also poor men have the right to vote and should also be included in considerations uh, of the government. That is actually not what Bentham wrote at all. Bentham also argued that Catholics uh, should be included and they were actually the first to be emancipated. He argued for women's rights, and he argued for uh, animal rights as well. Um, this was all published during his lifetime. Posthumously, and after his death, they found, much later, uh, letters where he also argued that gays are human. So for those of you uh, of this uh, sexual orientation, this is where you are in the rank order, right? Bentham dared during his lifetime to argue for animal rights. He did not during his lifetime dare argue for gay rights. He did write it up. He did not dare publish it, right? Um, but uh, <coughs> the argument here is that if you're interested in pain and pleasure, then you should include everything that can experience pain and pleasure. And this perhaps strikes people in England as a bit extreme, uh, but if you look at uh, the religions in India, uh, this is actually a common position, right? That we should care for animals because of reincarnation, it may be your grandfather, um, but we should care for animals as well, including some fairly humble uh, animals, right? So it is not an uncommon uh, position uh, that we should include in there. But we are still on a slippery slope, right? The fact that we are able to experience pain and pleasure is a function of the fact that we have a central nervous system. If you take, uh, if I take you, and I cut you in half, then I have two dead halves of a human, right? If I take a worm and cut it in half, then I have two viable worms. And the reason that you won't survive this is because you need, uh, <laughs> I probably die of blood loss, um, but uh, the other part that I cut off doesn't live on because it is not connected to your brain any longer. But worms do not have a central uh, nervous system and therefore you can cut uh, worms in half and then you have two worms, right? And if you cannot argue that us is rich, white, Protestant man, then you can also not argue us is us because we have a central nervous system and you stupid worm does not and therefore I can do to you whatever I want, right? Once you're on this slope of reasoning, you need to come up with an objective criterion and the objective criterion cannot be oh, we have a central nervous system and therefore I don't care about things that don't have a central nervous system, right? And worms are worms, pretty simple animals. Octopuses also do not have a central nervous system. Octopuses have nine brains. One big one in the middle and then they have a separate brain for every tentacle. Uh, and that is how they coordinate things. 
It must be a completely alien uh, way of looking at the world, right? From our eyes, but probably the other way around too. And octopuses definitely have personality uh, and definitely can learn uh, from each other and definitely can adapt uh, to their environment and do seem to have a sense of morality. Completely different than ours, but they do seem to have uh, these sort of things as well. And perhaps we should therefore extend at least parts of what are no longer human rights to these sort of animals as well. But it doesn't stop there. Because if you look through the microscope, it's actually very difficult to say what is alive and what is not. And there's a, an ongoing debate whether viruses are alive or not. And you may have picked up that every so often they claim, somebody claims that they've discovered life on Mars. But really what they've seen are organic uh, compounds. And it's very difficult to tell definitely from uh, a long distance whether an organic compound is something that is alive or dead or something that is just an organic compound, right? Um, so some people say, well, if you do not have the right to chop off my arm, then I also do not have the right to chop off a piece of coal and burn it. And now we're in deep ecology territory, right? That natural resources are sacrosanct. And the uh, rights that we would extend to humans, and I think you all agree that we should not be chopping off each other's arms, uh, then extend also to the integrity of a forest. You cannot just go and lop off uh, a branch. And also extend to coal reserves that you cannot just go off uh, and chop off a piece, right? Uh, and there's definitely people uh, who argue uh, this. Uh, the second picture that you see there is a lump of coal. Uh, are holy rocks uh, by the uh, Australian Aborigines, right? Who would definitely be very upset if you come and take part of those rocks away. Right? Now there is no answer to this, right? I'm not saying that you should stop here or you should go there or here. Well, actually I would argue. <laughs> If you would not include humans of a different skin color uh, in this, uh, you would actually have a fight on your hands with me. Um, but the extent to which we go beyond humans is not for me to decide for you, right? That is something that you should make up your mind uh, yourself. Um, so that is naturalism. And the question there is, who is a human agent or what is a human agent and to what extent do we ascribe rights and duties to other beings rather than ourselves and on what grounds. And there's major implications, right? Do we want to maximize the well-being of the people in the United Kingdom or do we also want to maximize the well-being of the people plus the sheep and the cows and everything. You get a very different answer because the way we treat uh, farm animals is not necessarily nice, right? Um, so that is um, naturalism. Humanism comes in two forms and the first of these forms is uh, libertarianism. Um, and libertarianism is all about individual rights and liberties. It's about process. Uh, libertarianism libertarianism uh, goes back to John Locke. Um, 17th century, I want to say, uh, who argued that property is just if it is acquired through labor. So if you go into the forest 
you chop it down and you turn it into something that is useful for agriculture, you have done so through your own labor and therefore this piece of land is yours. That is what Locke argued. And of course we see echoes of this in the Homestead Act in the United States in 1865, if I'm not mistaken. We also still see this going on in uh, the Brazilian uh, Amazon, right? That if you go in and you cultivate a piece of land, it becomes yours. That is the law of the land. Now Locke argued this because the king at the time, and it was one of the stewards, but don't ask me which one, argued that all of England and Scotland belongs to me, the king, right? That was the argument uh, that, that Locke was having. He said, well, I, I did the work, so it belongs to me, right? Now, Locke's position is all good and well, but it's not very practical, right? Because most of the stuff that we have is not stuff that we made through our own labor. So much, much later, 20th century, uh, Robert Nozick, who you see there, um, oh, it's a strange picture, um, that property is also justified if it is obtained through free consent. So if we consent, if we go and exchange things voluntarily, then that is fine too. And that is libertarianism in its extreme form, right? As long as the original acquisition of property is just and the rest of property comes about through a free exchange, then everything is fine. So there's no concept whatsoever about the income distribution, right? If things were acquired in a legal way, then everything is fine. Um, there's no role for distributional policy. If somebody is poor, then yeah, bad luck. Uh, and the argument here is very much a very minimal government, right? Uh, and you see the guy on the right, left. Uh, uh, property or taxation is theft. The government does not come in and ask for my permission to tax me. No, the government just takes away my money. That is an unjust trans, uh, transition, right? So the government has no right to do this, is what a libertarian would argue. And that immediately means that the government is essentially down to charity, right? Um, and the government only has a role in preventing people from stealing stuff from each other. Uh, and it has some role to play, as Adam Smith argued, in the provision of public goods and externalities. It's are essentially involuntary uh, transactions. Other than that, the government is very, very small. Now, this is a position that you would find uh, in some wings of the Republican Party in the United States. Uh, Rand Paul and people like that would be classical uh, libertarians. Uh, and also the position that you would find in the extreme wings of the Tory party in this country, um, where people would indeed argue uh, for this. And not too many, there's far fewer here in this country than in the United States, uh, but there's definitely a few uh, around there. <coughs> So that is libertarianism, and then the third school of thought is utilitarianism. And that is, of course, the foundation on which economics is built, and the first um, main uh, the guy who mainly argued for utilitarianism is uh, Jeremy Bentham. Here he is again. Um, and uh, utilitarianism is essentially about pain and pleasure. We want to maximize, pay, maximize pleasure and minimize uh, pain, right? Um, at the individual level and then as well at the social uh, level. Um, and that is what utilitarianism is. And essentially this is, doesn't matter how this goal is achieved, the greatest good for the greatest number, 
The only thing that matters is that it is achieved. So utilitarian, uh, utilitarianists would look at the government of Singapore and say, safe society, orderly society, a rich society, what more do you want, right? You want voting rights, you want freedom of expression, ah. You're safe and you're rich, what do you care, right? You want to say in how your country is run, it doesn't matter, right? That is utilitarianism. The only thing that matters is the outcome. And the outcomes in Singapore are actually pretty good. <laughs> it's just that the people of Singapore have no say uh, in this, right? Um, then uh, the question, of course, is how do you define the greatest good for the greatest number? So the narrow utilitarianism that you would see in economics textbooks is that utility is individual, people are atoms, right? Um, that moral agents are human, all humans, right? Uh, but definitely no non-humans. Uh, and that welfare is the simple sum uh, of utilities. But there's also a broader school uh, of utilitarianism where people are not atoms, but they may care about each other. Um, and it may include uh, some animals. Um, and welfare is some function uh, of utilities, right? So in the uh, narrow sense of utilitarianism, we're essentially in uh, Pareto um, efficiency, right? So a situation A is Pareto superior to another situation B, if at least one person is better off and no one is worse off, it's hard to disagree with that, right? Um, and then a situation is Pareto optimal or efficient if there are no Pareto improvements possible anymore, right? And you recall this from uh, your micro or your principles. Um, and that goes back to uh, Vilfredo Pareto, who you see on the top. Now, that is not how we do things, uh, because this is, you can't do much uh, with Pareto improvements and Pareto superiority. Um, because for most interesting situations, there's always someone who gets hurt in the process, right? Even though it may be better for society as a whole, it's very hard to think of sort of a policy that makes everybody happy. Um, so typically, typically we talk about potential Pareto improvements. And a potential Pareto improvement, a, 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 a situation A is a potential Pareto improvement to situation B if you can redistribute the gains so that nobody is better off, uh, worse off, right? So some of the gains are taken away from the winners and given to the losers to compensate them, right? That is Pareto, a potential Pareto uh, superiority. Um, and this is also often called Caldor Hicks, right? This is just two words that you need to know, right? Um, a potential Pareto improvement is something that is intuitive. A Calder-Hicks improvement is something, uh, yeah, what's that then? Uh, after uh, these two guys uh, here. But it's, it's the, the same thing. Um, we have, of course, uh, our welfare theorems, right? Um, a perfectly competitive uh, equilibrium is a Pareto optimum. That's the first welfare theorem. And the second welfare theorem, any Pareto optimum, can be achieved as a perfectly competitive equilibrium with the appropriate reallocation of resources. Right? And the gentlemen uh, that did this are uh, the first to sort of say it was um, Adam Smith. And then the first proofs, the first graphical proofs of a Leonard and Harold Telling proved it and Oscar Lange and Fred Taylor uh, refined uh, this, right? Um, Lange and Taylor came up with the second welfare uh, theorem. Um, 
Then the final question uh, for today is, so what does um, a utility function or a welfare function look like, right? Um, so let's assume that utility is given by a vector x, right? x are the things that make us happy. And at the moment, we're completely unconcerned about what is in x or what that function u uh, looks like. We are concerned about what is the w, what is the social welfare uh, look like. And that is a function of all um, the utilities. Now, typically the way we think about this is through a so-called uh, Bergson-Samuelson welfare function. And then typically we look at that in the form of uh, Tony Atkinson where utility or social welfare W is the sum of individual utilities UI raised to the power one minus gamma. And then for sanity's sake, we divide the whole thing uh, by one minus gamma. That is how we typically see a welfare function. This is that greater good for the greater, greatest number. This is the thing we want to maximize. And the standard economics way of doing this, going back to Bentham, is to set that gamma to zero and simply add up the utilities. We raise everything to the power one and then we divide it by one, right? So nothing happens and we simply add up utilities. So the total welfare in the room is the sum of how happy everybody is at the moment. Uh, probably people are longing for the end and for coffee, right? Uh, and a break. Um, there's other ways of doing it. Um, <clears throat> you, instead of the simple sum, you can also let gamma go to one and then uh, uh, deploy uh, L'Hopital. Um, and then you have the product of the utilities. That is what the uh, capital Pi means there. Instead of multiplying the utilities, you, instead of adding the utilities, you multiply them. And that goes back to uh, one of the Bernoullis, I forget which one, um, and John Ness also argued uh, for this. This puts more emphasis on the plight of the poor. And that can best be seen by letting gamma get larger still, and larger still, and larger still. And if gamma goes to infinity, then your welfare function becomes uh, the minimum of all your utilities. So social welfare then is how well off the poorest member of society is. That is how you measure society, right? So this is a very extreme left-wing uh, position, typically associated, although he may disagree, um, God, how can I forget his name? Um, this guy here. Um, of course, if you can let gamma go to plus infinity, you can also let it go to minus infinity, and then you only care about the richest people in society, right? It's probably not a position that you would take. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche did argue at one point that the aim of government was to at least try to make one man, and of course it was a man, to at least try to make one man happy and all resources of society should flow towards this one, ga uh, one aim that perhaps if somebody at least was not miserable anymore, then we had achieved our social goals, right? And then, of course, you want to maximize the utility of the best off person in society. So there is a lot of things uh, you can play with here. Uh, the standard form that you would find in any economics textbook is the one in the middle, right? Where gamma is zero, and we don't care about the distribution. We just care about the sum total of utility. But there's absolutely no reason why we would stick with that assumption. Okay, I'm going to break here. I hope to see you guys tomorrow for the seminars. Uh, and I'm going to finish this discussion next week.